Welcome to the Daily Show Global Edition. I'm Trevor Noah. Before we begin, some news coming out of South Korea. The world famous pop group BTS has asked their fans not to attend their shows due to the coronavirus. Yeah. And you know, less successful bands are gonna use that as an excuse when no one buys their tickets, right? <laughs> yeah, just be like, oh, uh, nobody came, but that's because we told them not to. So this one goes out to you, mom. <laughs> All right, here are this week's headlines. Let's kick it off with NASA, America's most expensive way of collecting rocks. If you wanted <laughs> to be an astronaut when you were a little kid, first of all, congratulations on being basic. And secondly, <laughs> this may be your big chance. You want to be an astronaut? Well, you better know how to swim. NASA is looking for a new crop of cadets willing to take the plunge in hopes of reaching outer space. The odds of being selected are pretty low. NASA only needs about 20 trainees for the next class. Officials say degrees in math, science, and engineering are required, and you have to have a master's degree. So if you think you've got what it takes to survive not just a neutral buoyancy pool, but an actual mission in space, well, the next astronaut class opens up on Monday. Apply then. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we laughing? <laughs> Thank God this guy is covering NASA and not a tornado. Everyone here is now homeless or dead. <laughs> but yes, NASA is looking for new astronauts, but you can only apply if you have a master's degree and are in peak physical condition. Basically, you have to be an athletic nerd, which doesn't exist. You gotta be like Neil deGrasse Mike Tyson. That's what you gotta be. <laughs> Yeah, it's time to discuss supernovas. <laughs> I'm joking, Mike. Now, uh... <laughs> I'll be honest, I, th I think NASA's standards are too high. Like, you, you shouldn't need a master's degree to go to space. You just need two things. One, you need to know how to walk in slow motion. You're just like... <laughs> and two, you need courage. That's all you need. You know who NASA should hire? Those people who buy sushi at 7-Eleven. That's... <laughs> that's what you need in space. I see you aren't afraid of taking risks. You wanna, wanna, t wanna fly to Pluto? All right, another news. Remember the massive admission scandal that rocked American colleges last year? Well, yesterday, one big parent got the biggest sentence yet. This morning, the heiress to the hot pocket snack food fortune is heading to prison after a judge handed down the harshest sentence yet in the college admission scandal. Hot pockets. She understands the harm that her choices caused. She understands the impact that those choices had on students. Michelle Janevs sentenced to five months behind bars after pleading guilty to paying bribes to get her two daughters admitted to elite universities. That's right. The Hot Pockets heiress was sentenced to five months in prison. Although after two and a half months, they'll take her out, flip her over, and then put her back in. <laughs> by the way... By the way, can we admit, Hot Pockets heiress it's a very weird phrase <laughs> that is somehow both trashy and extremely upper class at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's like, introducing the Archduchess of Scratch-Off Lottery Tickets. <laughs> now, some people will be like, oh, five months doesn't seem like a long time in prison, but it really is, especially if you are a rich white woman. I mean, for them, that's basically life. <laughs> Think about it, by the time you get out, your book club has moved on to a totally new book. <laughs> If you go to prison in August, you'll completely miss pumpkin spice season. <laughs> and worst of all, your kids will have completely forgotten who you are. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be back like, it's me, your mom, the woman the nanny gives you to on the weekends, remember? <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, she might come out of prison with all new ideas for fillings for Hot Pockets, you know? <laughs> yeah, she'll be back in the boardroom like, all right, guys, forget that ham and cheese shit. We're doing toilet wine and cigarettes, come on. <laughs> I'm gonna put a shiv inside each one, so if anyone steps to Aunt Becky, they can catch a fade. <laughs> President Donald Trump, still not used to saying that. Last night, he flew 8,000 miles for his first state visit to India. Now, Trump's in India, partly to negotiate a trade deal and partly to get his copy of the Kama Sutra signed. <laughs> yeah, Trump and Melania use that book all the time. Her favorite position is the one where she's on top and he's not in the room. <laughs> now, you might be wondering, how would a country full of brown people react to a visit from Donald Trump? Well, it turns out from the moment Trump arrived, it was love at first sight. President Trump just arrived this morning for a two-day visit. The president received what's being called a King's Welcome, orchestrated by the Indian Prime Minister. The president headed a massive rally packed with more than 100,000 people. A Make America Great Again rally, India-style. 
They even blasted Macho Man before the president took the stage, and when he did, a show of affection for India's prime minister. Namaste, Trump! The president is overwhelmingly popular here in India, where his pro-business, tough-on-terror image is widely admired. I happen to like Prime Minister Modi a lot. He says between the stadium and, and the uh, airport, we'll have about 7 million people, so it's going to be very exciting. 7 million people came out to see Trump go from the airport to the stadium? That's impressive. Although, to be fair, it's also India. There's 7 million people between any two locations. <laughs> yeah, I mean... The line at Indian Starbucks is 7 million people. <laughs> there are Indian brides right now who are like, no, daddy, I just want a small wedding. No more than 7 million people. <laughs> it's like, okay, Anushka, first cousins only. <laughs> but it is true that Donald Trump is very popular in India. Right? Some like him because of his anti-Muslim rhetoric. Some like him because of his business savvy. And all of them like him because his skin looks like tikka masala. <laughs> and since India is so fond... <laughs> so fond of President Donald Jaipal Trump, they pulled out all the stops for his visits. At India's famous Taj Mahal, workers paint, spruce, and polish. Roads are renovated, and nearby, the Yamuna River rises as millions of litres of water are released to cover its foul, polluted smell. Preparations included a hastily built wall that critics say was meant to block the view of a slum, keeping thousands of poor people out of sight. Yeah, India is trying so hard to impress Trump that they're building new roads, cleaning up dams, and even building a wall to hide their slums. And you know Trump's gotta love that. He's just like, you see, they built a wall, and I haven't seen a single Mexican. <laughs> it works, folks. <laughs> now, India cleaning its rivers and streets for Trump might s seem extreme, but if you think about it, this is basically what guys do whenever a girl says she's coming over, right? <laughs> yeah, you make the bed, pick up your clothes, hide all your junk in the closet, then she calls and says she can't make it, and you're like, damn it, so I flushed the toilet for nothing? <laughs> So clearly, India is trying to give Trump a memorable experience. There was, however, one tiny culture clash that Trump had to deal with. Donald Trump is in India this morning, but he could be forced to go without his favorite meals of burgers and steaks. India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, a devout vegetarian, plans not to serve any meat to the president during his visit. One person who's familiar with President Trump's eating habits has told the media they're worried about how he'll cope with the lack of meat, saying, I have never seen him eat a vegetable. I honestly don't know what's stranger. The fact that Trump might eat vegetables or that people are actually worried about how it will go. Because you realize the news wasn't even snarky about it. They weren't like, ha ha, the president has to eat vegetables. They were like, yo, if Donald Trump eats broccoli, he could die. <laughs> So this is gonna be hard on Trump. And you know what I was thinking is what's worse for him is that cows are so sacred in India that they're allowed to just wander around in the city. So can you imagine how hard that's gonna be for him? He hasn't eaten beef for two days, and then he's just gonna start seeing cows in the streets, and he's gonna be like, oh my God, I'm hallucinating. All the cows I've eaten have come back to haunt me. I'm sorry, cows. I'm so sorry. So sorry. But I will say, I'm impressed, because despite the beef issue, Trump is making the best of his India trip. In fact, he even made an effort to show the Indian people how much he respects them by trying to speak their language. And it went about as well as you would think. <laughs> India welcomes us at the world's largest cricket stadium right here in Ababad. Namaste, Chiwala, Gujarat. Sardar Patel, Ashram, Suchin, Tendulkar, Gujarat, Goa, Diwali, as the great religious teacher Swami Vive Kamunand once said. Even if that pronunciation was right, that facial expression was so wrong. <laughs> that looked like the most exercise he's gotten in decades. Just like, come, come in, in, come in, in. All right, that's my steps for the day. I'm done. 
<laughs> oh, man. Now, now, this was really interesting. After Trump butchered half the Hindi dictionary, <laughs> Indian Twitter lost their minds, right? <laughs> People were coming on like, dude, it's not namuste, it's namaste. Who messes up namaste? It says namuste. But to those Indians, I say, please, don't be mad, right? Trump may not be able to pronounce Hindi words, but he can't pronounce English words either, so... <laughs> he's an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> and besides, think about it. It would have been way scarier if Trump had come out all fluent in Hindi. Can you imagine if he just came out and he's like, Kese tumare jail, me tum se pya, aapka baal bhoat sundare, kuch kuch, ote aai, bigly. It would've been weird. So, that was day one of President Trump's trip to India. And you know what? I'm proud of the president. I'm really proud of him for teaching us a valuable lesson. And that is no matter how old you are, you can still go to new places, make new friends, and have new mind-blowing experiences like eating a carrot for the first time. <laughs> and to that, I say, namuste. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Daily Show. <laughs> One of the most interesting stories of the 2020 election has been the rise of Pete Buttigieg. And no matter what you think of his candidacy, you have to agree that it's pretty amazing that a gay man can be a serious contender for president of the United States. But what do LGBTQ voters think about this moment in American politics? Well, we sent Jabuki Young White to sit down with some of them to find out. I'm here in New York City, gay capital of the world, except for Berlin, San Francisco, or Congress. Here to talk to some LGBTQ voters. Anyway, I've come to the Leslie Lohman to talk with LGBTQ voters about finally getting the gay presidential candidate we've all dreamed of. So if someone told you 10 years ago that there was going to be a gay presidential candidate, how do you feel like you would have reacted? Because I know for me, I would have been like, who told you I'm gay? <laughs> was it Kevin? No, I would, I would have believed it, but I would think it would be a woman, though. 10 years ago, Barack Obama was still evolving about marriage. It's a real leap to think that 10 years later, we would have a viable queer candidate for president of the United States. But being proud of Pete doesn't mean that we're voting for him. Raise your hand if you plan on voting for Mayor Pete in the primary. I don't think it's possible for me. There's nothing that you could do to make you vote for him? No. Our community actually has a bit of a shameful history in the sense that gay white men have historically marginalized the contributions of trans women and trans men and people of color. I am trans and in, you know, knowing that there's gonna be a, you know, a cis gay, Presidential candidate doesn't do anything to make my life any safer as a trans woman. And that's the divide. According to my unofficial poll, the type of gay you are determines whether you trust Pete to represent you. A lot of people will say that he's not queer enough or he's not gay enough. What does gay that enough. even mean? He's gay enough if we can hold his feet to the fire to make sure that our voices are heard. I live in South Bend and I work with Black Lives Matter South Bend and those are, they don't have trust for Pete. So you want him to wear a leather harness and you want him and Jason to open their relationship and you want them to be poly. We just want him to actually pay attention to the policing problem. I had a face to face with him and I asked him, what are you doing about the police brutality in Indiana? And he kept saying, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to push me. I, want to I don't need to push you. You know what needs to be done. Okay, so you're not asking him to be more gay. You just want him to care about the margins. Correct. I want him to care about the marriages and leave the doctors at home. Pete's rainbow booty shorts are actually just a pair of relaxed fit dockers, which is why I wonder if his mainstream appeal is that you can kind of forget he's gay. As much as we can say that Pete's brand of queerness has problematic aspects, don't you think that that actually makes him electable? For example, look at this. That is my brand of queerness. We don't have a picket fence, but that looks like a picture of my husband and me. The word that's not there is first gay family. You know, the word that's there is first family. That is something America can, can get behind, I think. I see it as a disappointingly sanitized version of what it means to be gay. To a lot of critics, this looks like this. Oh. They're less a gay couple and more so just like uh, two guys who decided to make granola in their kitchen. They're clearly gay. And if that's not gay enough for the people in this country, I don't know what would be. So it sounds like 
the takeaway of this conversation should be if Buttigieg does not eat his husband's ass on live TV, he is not gay enough for me. I'm out. <laughs> How about this? Gay people, we're basically straight. N no. I mean, the takeaway is also that for a lot of voters, you can't just choose gay. You also have to think about your race. Okay, Pete Buttigieg. Black people don't like him because of the police stuff and homophobia or something. But black people like him. And a lot of black people don't. Pete Buttigieg, a lot of black people don't like him, but some do. Can you imagine how fun it will be to watch a gay, married, Midwestern mayor destroy Donald Trump? Okay, I hear you. Pete Buttigieg, I'm taking Trump to pound town. No one wants to see that. No. So then what is it? I think the takeaway should be that um, the LGBT community is not a monolith, and uh, you know the first gay presidential candidate means very different things to very different people in our community. Whether you believe Pete is the visibility we spent decades fighting for, or just another centrist white guy who's easy on the eyes and the police, the gay community is making it clear. If you want our vote, you better work, bitch. I can't, I'm not fucking saying that. I can't fucking say that. What the fuck does that even mean? Chibuki Young White, everybody. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Daily Show. My guest tonight is a writer who explores racism and privilege in her New York Times best-selling debut novel called Such a Fun Age. Please welcome Kylie Reed. <laughs> Welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you for having me. Uh, congratulations on your debut novel being a New York Times bestseller. Seven weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. That's amazing. Um, and congratulations on creating a book that's not just doing well, but it's creating so much buzz in the right ways. You know, you have fans that include Reese Witherspoon, who's made it like her book club book of, of the month. You've got uh, uh, Lena Waithe, who bought it, you know, got, bought the film rights for the book, which right. is really fantastic. Um, the book is an interesting one because it opens with 25-year-old Amira, who is this woman who works as a babysitter, working for a white family who's very rich, and things basically go wrong. Yeah. Like, where, where do you even come up with a story like that? Because it seems like a simple story. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's just gonna be babysitter world, and it's like, no, it turns into fake kidnapping and then white privilege. It's funny, but it's also deep at the same time. Right. Where does that come from? I think that in many ways, this is a really old story, a black caregiver and a white woman and a white child, and their interactions are really precarious and charged. And from the very first chapter, Amira is accused of kidnapping this child, and she's humiliated, and I think that what makes it different is someone pulls out a cell phone, and people relationship to racist incident becomes different when they right. see it firsthand. Right. Now, I don't want to spoil what happens later on in the book, but I will, I will tell people what really is the catalyst, in my opinion, okay. in the story, and that is you have Amira being in this place where she's been accused of kidnapping this little white child. Um, you also have an incident in the family where there's, there's a racist incident with the husband, right. the family's under siege, and then the woman who's in the house, Alex, calls her and says, hey, Amira, I need you to come and look after my child while we're trying to work through this whole racism thing. And then she wants to be her friend. And that's really what the yeah. book is in and around. I think so, too. Um, it's definitely, I mean, that happens. You get a little crush on someone. You think they seem really cool and interesting. But that layer between them, this is your employee. And right. you have to respect her space, and that's where things get tricky. Why do you, why do you think it, it becomes so tricky? Because I, I think it's hard to explain it to people. And it's, it's a really wonderful book to read because it's so natural. But how did you manage to capture how tricky it can be? Is, is there a reason you went with that for the story? You know, it, it, it could have been a, a simpler story. It could have been one that didn't com contain as much complexity, which would really get us into these conversations. Because yeah. I've read reviews from everyone of every race, every, every walk of life saying, I see myself in the story in a different way. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason you went with this specific story? It's probably because I love awkward moments. I just can't get enough of them when I watch <laughs> people squirm and I, when I read something that makes me have to put a book back down, those are my absolute favorite moments. And so it's, it's not fortunate for my characters. Right. So that's what I love to read, yeah. How many people have asked to touch your hair? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna say the limit does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> Many. And it's all those little things that are so layered in history right. that I love writing about. Yes. So, let me ask you this. If someone's reading this book and they go, Kylie, I'm, 
I'm, I'm really trying, you know, I'm, I'm a white person who's really trying. I didn't even realize I'm, I'm, these microaggressions are taking place. I didn't even know that I'm offending people in these moments. I'm really trying. When someone reads this book, what do you hope that they would take from it that would give them a greater understanding of what they're doing in the world or how they're interacting with people of color? Oh, and this, this does happen. At every reading I have, there's a white woman who's just finished reading it, and she's, like, not ready to do this whole thing with me yet. Right. She's like, I don't know what you want me to do from this book. Um, I think the biggest thing is the influence of the society rather than the individual. I feel that as soon as I start saying, you're a bad person, right. I stop judging the systems that keep poor people poor and give people permission to treat other people this way. Wow. Um, there's a really big racist incident in the first chapter where Amira is racially profiled, but for the rest of the novel, she's struggling to get health insurance. And that is something that has been a problem for domestic labor workers since the 1930s and before that as well. And so I think covering these bigger issues of systemic racism is way more important than, you know, did I say the right thing in front of my cool babysitter? It really is fascinating that you've done that because, you know, when reading through the book, one thing that jumps out to me is you have this world where you've tackled an issue that many people have commented on. You know, I see it a lot online, people saying, for instance, when there's a presidential debate or when people are talking to politicians, they make it seem like there are black issues yes. and then there are issues for every other American, when, in fact, black people have issues like anyone else can. And in this book, you, you seem to highlight that. It's one issue of race, and then there are just issues of life that anyone can face. Oh, yeah. Was that purposeful? Oh, 100%. I think that talking about race without talking about class is kind of a moot point. And there's black women in the novel who are wealthy and have really high respectability politics and believe that Amir should want more for her life. And then there she has other black friends who support her in everything she does. And I think not including all of those differences does a disservice to black women. Well, I, I'll tell you this. You've written a book that is funny, it's engaging, uh, it is wonderfully awkward in many moments. You don't want to put it down. You read it so quickly. Um, this is not going to be your first best-selling novel, so thank you so much thank for being on the so show. Thank you so much for having me. Really, really wonderful to read. Such a fun age is available now. You definitely want to go out and get it. Can you read, everybody? We'll be right back. All right, well, that's it for the Daily Show Global Edition. I'm Trevor Noah. Before we go, some news out of London. The city has offered to host the 2020 Summer, Summer Olympic Games if Tokyo has to cancel them over the coronavirus. That's what London has said. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm disappointed in you, London, because this is a classic player-hating move. Yeah. <laughs> Being like, hey, girl, I couldn't help notice your man has the coronavirus. You, uh, <laughs> you wanna roll with me? That's trash.